Hello and welcome to our talk on some of the graphical features and optimizations for Gears 5. My name is Mike Prezel. I'm the PC Rendering Lead at the Coalition. I'll be joined shortly by Chris Wallace, also from the Coalition Rendering Team. Later on, we'll hear from Jordan Logan from AMD, whom we worked with very closely while we were shipping Gears 5 on PC. Before we get into that, here's a bit of a background on the engine we are using and some of our goals for Gears 5. First, we are running off of a 4.11 branch of Unreal that is multiple years old at this point and has been heavily modified during Gears 4 and Gears 5 to hit some of our specific performance and visual needs. One of our biggest changes for Gears 5 was that very early on in the project we set the aggressive goal that our campaign would run at a solid 60 frames per second on Xbox One X and across all of our PC specs, including the minimum spec. Also, where players would choose between 4K or 60 FPS on Gears 4 for Xbox One X, we wanted both Xbox One X and PC Ideal Spec to run at 4K 60 FPS. This was an ambitious and mildly terrifying goal. Also, when we say a solid 60 FPS, we mean hitch free on all of the platforms that we support, which if you've ever done any kind of DX12 work, you know this is a whole lot easier said than done. Finally, we are going to have large sand and snow SEBI open worlds. In addition to having never tackled open worlds in the Gear series, there were some technical challenges to making sand and snow interact with characters that we would have to address. Let's start at the end and show a quick clip of the final product. This is gameplay footage from the beginning of the game. Listen, no won't hurt her. This is my call, all right? If the first minister doesn't like it, she can yell at me, which she almost certainly will. Tell us where to go, Control. I'll do my best, but remember, no one's been in that facility for like 25 years. Yeah, that's pretty evident. You're not there to buy a timeshare. You're there to launch an old hammer of town prototype. And your intel says one of the silos is still intact, right? Yeah, as far as they can tell. We were really happy with where we ended up visually. It took the collective effort of our talented art, VFX, tech art, and engineering groups at the Coalition to land where we did. We'll be narrowing in on just one slice of the equation here, which is some of the rendering innovations that helped us hit that visual bar at 60 FPS. This is a two-part talk. For part one, we'll go over some of the techniques we used to render the terrain and environments of Gears 5. We'll start with a couple of the techniques we developed to push the amount of detail that we could get out of our existing terrain geometry. Then we'll go into how we made our worlds more interactive, such as the water effects from the clip you just saw, but also our system for creating persistent multi-mile tracks in the open worlds. For the second part, we will go over some of the optimizations we used to get both PC and Xbox One X to that buttery smooth, hitch-free 60 FPS. We'll go over topics like how we moved our post-processing pipeline to be done on async compute, and then dive into some of the advanced D3D12 techniques for addressing hitches. Now let's dive in. I'll be starting off by talking about some of our techniques for enhancing our geometry detail. Our static terrain makes up all of our ground meshes that don't require any interaction. In terms of getting better visual fidelity without just throwing more triangles at it, a relief mapping approach like parallax occlusion mapping seemed attractive. The idea here is that you can take a low poly mesh and then combine it with higher resolution height maps and use ray marching to do last minute UV adjustments. Because you're just faking geometry, things tend to break if you're at an angle where you can see the lack of silhouette. However, our typical third-person camera angles and gears hide this weakness pretty well. However, naive parallax occlusion mapping still has multiple weaknesses. If you don't do enough ray marching steps, you get bad visual artifacts. Take too many, and you take a performance hit. To make matters worse, you end up taking the most steps as the plane approaches a glancing angle, which is the most common case for a ground plane. This is where relaxed cone step mapping comes in. We will also use the term RCSMs since relaxed cone step mapping is a bit of a mouthful. GPU Gems 3 has a pretty thorough description of how it works, but for the context of the next few slides, here's a quick high level breakdown. Parallax occlusion mapping walks down the height map pixel by pixel until it gets a hit. In the top image, each column represents a pixel in the height map, and the numbers represent each ray marching step. As you can see, Parallax occlusion mapping is pretty brute force. It can be tempting to attempt to do a binary search or take larger steps, but without extra information, there's no way to know how far you can jump without potentially skipping a small bump in the height map. This is where relaxed cone step mapping comes in. 
By adding an extra channel to the height map that contains cone angle information, you can bake out information that guarantees when you take a step, you will only ever penetrate a surface once. In other words, you will never enter and exit a surface within a single step. This ensures you won't skip any small bumps and you can find an inter intersection point much faster as seen in the bottom image. This is a very simplified view of our CSMs. Again, please take a look at GPU Gems 3 for a great thorough explanation. Here's a shot of water pouring down some rocks from the same area of the earlier clip. This is with RCMs off. The normal maps do a pretty decent job of conveying geometry, but it's pretty apparent that this is a low poly ground mesh. This is the same shot with RCMs on. The rocks here look like true geometry, but at a fraction of the cost of attempting to do the same thing with a denser mesh. I'll go back one more time just so you can see the difference. Off on. And here's a bit more drastic example from one of our ice levels, first with RCSMs off and on. Integration of relaxed cone step mapping is pretty straightforward as you can see from the example pixel shader code below. We hard coded this to only alter UV0, but this could be applied to any UVs. Since the inputs are isolated and the only side effects are a transformation of the UVs, you can plop this RCSM code into the start of a pixel shader, or make this a node that can be inserted into any material graph. We've purposefully left out the meat of the functionality, the implementation of Calc RCSM, because it was from GPU Gems 3, and we, rec and we recommend that you look at it there. I'll also add that this initial implementation doesn't do anything extra for self-shadowing, like was called out in GPU Gems 3, but the transform of UVs alters the normals so the lighting remains consistent. The performance overhead of using RCSMs ranged between 0.2 and 0.4 milliseconds on the Xbox One X at 4K, which given that we're talking about meshes that can take up potentially 50% of the screen, that's a pretty reasonable cost for the boost in visual look. One of the great things about RCSMs is that in our standard implementation, you don't have to pay the cost in the pre-pass, so you only pay for RCSMs in the base pass if a pixel is visible on screen. The standard RCSM implementation uses a fixed amount of cone step loop iterations. We allowed for the loop count to be configurable, which was critical for our scalability. One trick we used was to reduce the amount of steps as an object gets further away. The rate of fall off was configured per platform. Here's an example of what this looks like off with low settings and then with ultra settings. Between the off and the mid, you should see some difference between the close up snow and between mid and ultra, there should be some difference in the snow up the ramp on the right. One other thing to point out is that for our ultra settings, we scale up the height maps to give things a little bit more texture since we can afford the ray barging steps. Overall, we found this can be a powerful way of getting LOD style controller performance without the hassle of LOD style transitions. We mentioned not altering depth to keep the cost down, but we do support a way of adjusting the depth buffer based on the results of our CSM. First, Let's take a look at RCSMs without depth offset, where the shadows act as if it's a flat surface. Now let's take a look with depth offset, where you can see it conform to the swirl pattern RCSM. You could do this using the SV depth shader semantic, but you would lose early Z optimizations and also end up moving RCSM calculations into your pre-pass shader. We instead implemented this by outputting depth to a UAV in the base pass and then blending it on afterwards. This still gives shadows an SSAO that conforms to the relief map while keeping uh, reasonable performance. While this didn't fit in the budget for Gears 5, we will pursue it for our future projects. Hi, this is Chris. I'll be taking over to talk about our interactive terrain and effects. RCSMs were great for static terrain, but require baking out data, and so they can't provide any level of interaction with the environments. In addition, a big part of the sand and snow open worlds were trails, and we wanted to enable silhouettes around characters and vehicles that just wouldn't be possible with RCSM trickery. So tessellation seemed like the best fit for our goals. Whole and domain shader tessellation were a reasonable option, but they are also notoriously slow, and particularly for our open worlds, we knew our GPU budget wasn't going to be forgiving. So we instead decided to take a bet on using compute shaders to do tessellation instead.
At the time, we knew the prepass wasn't fully saturating the GPU and figured this was a perfect candidate for async compute. A second bet was that we would be able to cache and reuse a tessellated mesh across multiple frames and multiple passes, keeping in mind that a mesh is generally re-rendered three or four times when you consider the prepass, base pass, and shadow cascades. The DirectX SDK already had an adaptive tessellation compute sample, which was targeted as a way of emulating hole and domain shaders via compute shader. So this served as a good starting point for our implementation. Our tessellation on the GPU is split into two stages. After finding a mesh that we've determined either needs to be tessellated or have its tessellation updated, we dispatch a compute shader that first calculates an edge factor, which represents how much to tessellate a triangle for each edge. After we have the edge factor, we then calculate what the size, the output, tessellated vertex, and index buffer will be. At this point, the size results are on the GPU, but we need them on the CPU to actually allocate the backing memory for the new tessellated mesh. We don't actually stall on the CPU for these results, but opportunistically check for results and wait a frame if it's not available. In practice, that wait never exceeds a single frame. After allocating the buffers, we then use the tessellation factors and actually output the tessellated vertices, as well as do some final interpolation of other per-vertex attributes like texture UVs. This is how it looks amortized over multiple frames. Recall we're overlapping over the current frame's prepass, so we can't use our tessellated mesh within the same frame. Using the untessellated mesh for the prepass and the tessellated mesh for the base pass would cause z-fighting, and so we're forced to wait until frame three before we can finally consume the mesh. We have an optimization where we can further amortize the tessellation GPU cost by splitting the final tessellation step into two separate steps. We also throttle if we find we're tessellating too much within a single frame to avoid slowing down the graphics queue too much. However, if we detect the camera is moving too quickly, we start to roll back on the throttling or frame amortization to avoid any kind of popping of tessellation. Due to the requirement to read results back on the CPU though, we're always at the mercy of three frames of latency. However, because 60 FPS was our baseline, this generally worked pretty well for us. How much we tessellate is based on the distance to the camera and whether it's within the view frustum. View frustum culling could be done, but if the output mesh can cast shadows, we can't completely remove triangles, even if they're off screen, so we just remove tessellation. We also tessellate slightly outside of the frustum, padding more based on camera velocity to try and mitigate any kind of popping from quick camera movements. Here's an example of a scene where we have a landscape terrain and trails that are dynamically being created by characters. Tessellation is off here, and again, the trails look fine thanks to normal mapping tricks, but they're clearly flat. And this is with tessellation on. You can see the trails around the character are now are clearly 3D. As a side benefit, you can also see the rocky landscape on the left has more detail on it too. I'll toggle back and forth one more time. This is off, and this is on. And here's a separate scene, but in wireframe, with a left-right comparison showing how many more triangles we can crank out using our tessellation system. As you can see, our output mesh was pretty dense. On Xbox One X, this costed us around 0.9 milliseconds, all things accounted for. But to be clear, the cost here is purely from the vertex shader consuming the larger, vert for larger vertex buffers and some heavy-handed material operations. The actual act of tessellation almost became invisible when overlapped over the prepass. All our amortization tricks likely contribute to this, but also looking at the hardware counters, our tessellation was mostly VALU bound, whereas our prepass is mostly pixel rate bound. On the original Xbox, we did see it penalize the prepass, but only by 0.1 millisecond. And we almost got away with all of our frame amortization shenanigans, but then we remembered that sometimes you have camera cuts. The problem is we don't opt to tessellate a mesh until it's on screen, and once it's on screen, it takes three frames of latency before we can provide the tessellated mesh. Usually it's not noticeable, but when the camera is close to the terrain, it can be pretty jarring, like in this semantic here. If you watch the snow here on the ground, you'll see a distinct pop. The primary issue stopping us from doing everything in one frame was the need to read back the vertex and index buffer size results on the CPU. Some reasonable options were to write a memory allocator compute shader, um, 
our output tessellation meshes were all suballocated out of a single large buffer, so this isn't as crazy as it sounds. Or, if we detect we need tessellation results immediately, fall back to using the hole and domain shader tessellation. However, by the time we were hitting this, there just weren't enough cycles to pursue either of these options, and because it was scoped to a select few cinematics, we landed on a much less exciting solution. The ability to add controllable spheres of tessellation that our tech artists could place several frames in advance of a camera cut. Yeah, it's gross, but I promise we're not always this abusive to our tech artists. So enough about geometry. Let's move on to the fun stuff, interacting with environments. For interactive environments, we developed a system called the Interaction Pass. Internally, this was actually called the Pre-Pre-Pass, which was a terribly confusing name, so for the purposes of clarity, we'll stick with the name the Interaction Pass. The Interaction Pass was inspired by an Uncharted 4 talk where they take a buffer with a top-down projection and render colliders into it that are later read to deform water surfaces. The Interaction Pass took a more generalized version of that approach to make something flexible enough that it wasn't just scoped to collisions. Meshes or particle systems would be rendered into the Interaction Pass render target and then is later used by the materials to do a variety of effects. In the video, you can see a debug visualization of the Interaction Pass texture on the bottom left where it's being used to create water ripples. The Interaction Pass uses a full 4-channel FP16 render target. From the engine perspective, we just take the albedo of anything marked to go in the Interaction Pass and slam it straight into the render target without any lighting or modification to the albedo. The Interaction Pass contents can be read back using a material node that takes in a world position and outputs the albedo at that location. This combination gave tech artists full control of both the inputs to the Interaction Pass and then how to use that information in the material graph. From the engineering point of view, the Interaction Pass is one of the more straightforward implementations, but our tech artists were able to get a lot of mileage out of it. As a demonstration of that, on the right is an example of the Interaction Pass being used in three ways within that first clip. You can see the water ripples, which you saw already, but also wind deformation from the helicopter and foliage collision with the characters. Because sand and snow were core elements of the game, characters leaving sand and snow trails was an important ask. At first, the Interaction Pass seemed like a reasonable solution for this, but if you wanted to have a long trail, you'd have to have a particle system with a high level of persistence. In addition, to handle our animated effects, the Interaction Pass was cleared each frame and would require re-rendering the entire trail of a particle system, which you can imagine gets expensive. We considered if we could have some sort of spline system, but we needed something that would work well both for our ski-like vehicle, the skiff, and walking characters. And while splines map well to ski-like trails, it would be hard to map to the trails left when walking, particularly when thinking of other actions like rolling where other parts of the body are deforming the snow. Another option was to just not re-render the interaction past each frame. This gets difficult if you need the render target to follow the character because you constantly need to shift your render target contents. Tomb Raider used a rolling window technique to accomplish something like this, so it was certainly an option, but you can't persist rails for very long since the max trail length is limited to the size of the interaction pass texture around your character. So instead, we did something completely different and ended up going with a texture atlas based approach, which we called the deformer pass. This works by having two textures, a sparsely populated atlas, which contains your trail information, and then an indirection texture that helps you map from world space to the atlas. The entire level is divided up into coarse axis aligned tiles. Each tile is given a 16-bit pixel and a larger indirection texture that represents a coordinate in the texture atlas. The first 8 bits are an index in the x-axis, and the second 8 bits are an index into the y-axis. The atlas itself was a single channel texture that could either be a 16-bit or 32-bit floating point value representing the world depth. It's also divided into tiles that are allocated and invected in an LRU fashion as the player walks into tiles that haven't been allocated yet. The actual dimensions could be changed based on the level and were agnostic to the world size. It would just affect how soon an old tile will be evicted. Here on the right is a debug view of the deformer pass, where you can see the LRU in action, actively allocating tiles in the atlas for your trails, and the terrain has been modified to show when a new tile has been allocated. Note that the texture makes it appear like depth here is Boolean, but that's just for debug purposes. The actual value is a full floating point value that represents the deepest deformation seen so far.
And all of this is persistent, so your trails never run out unless you get kicked out by the LRU. To actually populate the depth, we at first considered just rasterizing meshes as if it was a top-down depth pass, similar to Horizon Zero Dawn's snow trails approach. But our characters had extremely detailed meshes, so the performance wouldn't be cheap. In addition, to make a rasterization approach work with texture atlases, we'd potentially need to re-render a mesh multiple times if a mesh was on a texture atlas tile boundary. So a much simpler, more performant option was to use capsule representations. Because our characters already had capsule representations for capsule shadows, this approach worked right out of the box with no artist intervention. Even detailed characters had only around 20 capsules, so this was much less data than the triangle counterpart. We gather the capsules in an atlas tile and then ray trace from the top of the world downwards, the twist being that we're looking for the furthest intersection point for each pixel rather than the closest as is typical with ray tracing. This was also a great alternative to the interaction pass, which required special sprites for each kind of snow interaction like walking in snow versus rolling. With capsule deformation, all of the things, these things just worked out of the box. For each frame, we limit deformation calculations to only be done on tiles that have active deformers on them. In order to calculate which tiles are active, we check character AABBs to see what world space tiles they're in. This is more coarse, but faster than individually checking each capsule. We then do more fine-grained culling of capsules on the GPU, spreading the capsule culling across all the threads in a thread group. Our thread groups were 8x8, which is the standard size for running well across vendors, and so we cull for an 8x8 tile rather than the atlas tile size, which was generally much larger. Similar to the interaction pass, the deformer pass texture could be read from in a material using a deformer pass texture node that hid away all the texture atlas indexing logic. The input was just a world position and the output was the world depth. This made it possible for tech artists to do some really cool things like lerp material behavior based on how far the material was depressed. An optional technique we developed was the ability to have trails fade out over time. This can be useful for simulating buildup in a storm where you'd expect your trails to get covered up. But this was actually motivated to avoid artifacts where a tile from your trail would pop out of existence when it gets evicted from the texture atlas. What was particularly important about the implementation was that we didn't want performance to scale based on the trail length, but to always be consistently fast. In order to accomplish this, we had an optional third, very coarse atlas that only had one pixel for each atlas tile. We reused the indirection texture for the deformer pass, so there's no need for a second indirection texture. The way it worked was when there was a deformer in a tile, we would calculate it and update build up per pixel and write out updated depth and then write out our current tick to the timestamp buffer for that tile. Once a tile no longer has a deformer in it, we no longer write updated depth or update the timestamp buffer. And when we read back depth from the deformer pass, we sample the depth, but also the timestamp buffer to know how long a tile has been untouched and can use an adjustable buildup amount to calculate how much depth should have been accumulated. This was exactly what we wanted for performance because only tiles with actual deformers in it pay the cost for buildup. Here's a video of the buildup in action, first in wireframe and then in game. One of the cool things about this approach is the buildup is per pixel in the deformer pass atlas, so you get a smoother buildup than a comparative particle system based solution, which depends on your sprite size. Here's some of the settings we ended up shipping with. Each individual tile was 32 by 32 pixels, and when scaled to world space, was 3 by 3 meters wide. Allocating the tile size takes a delicate balance. Smaller squares mean that tiles fit better fit windy trails, but as is typical with GPU texture atlas approaches, each tile is required to have a one pixel border to ensure that hardware sampling doesn't cause you to read from neighboring tiles. So creating tiles that are too small will end up wasting a lot of space due to the ratio of memory used for the texture border. At the bottom, we have a table of different texture atlas dimensions and some theoretical approximations of how far your trail would be. A typical character is generally one tile wide and a vehicle is about three tiles wide, so that's where the approximations are coming from. You burn through tiles faster if you go diagonal, but this still gives you a rough sense of distance. One of the stretch goals of the system was to see if we could have a trail that could extend across our open worlds. And so we ended up going with the somewhat outrageous looking 1728 by 17 texture atlas resolution, which sounds kind of excessive, and it kind of is, but it's also kind of awesome. 
I took this using the debug camera to demonstrate the trail length. I ended up having to quadruple the video speed to keep this from being too long. Keep in mind the debug camera is already three to four times faster than the skip, so you'll see some LOD things break, but hopefully this gives you a sense of distance of the trails. Most players are used to these kinds of trails fading out over time, and so there's some points in the campaign where you'll bump into old trails from over 30 minutes ago while backtracking that are kind of cool showcases of the deformer pass. We ended up dropping the need to use the buildup feature for avoiding tile eviction artifacts because it's almost impossible to find the end of your trail. Here's the intro to our uh, settlement level, which is kind of a worst case scenario where there's at least a dozen deformers walking around on snow terrain, all leaving trails. Even in this worst case scenario, we see it still running relatively fast at 0.2 milliseconds on Xbox One X. And more of the typical case, we saw it running in under 0.1 millisecond. And so finally, this is just a brain dump of some of the expansions of these features that I think are all fairly interesting things to dig deeper into. RCSMs with decals can get some really cool effects. I act together a change that got RCMs working with decals, and this is a showcase of what one of our tech artists was able to put together on the same day. So we're really excited to see how we'd be able to use this in the future. For tessellation, our current system essentially just allowed us to dump more triangles, but didn't do anything like subdivision surfaces where you get actually smoother geometry. That was all done manually from the material. In the future, it'd be really interesting to see how we could use tessellation to programmatically smooth out a mesh. This is particularly appealing as a feature that would let us expand our scalability across an even wider spectrum of GPUs. Finally, our deformer paths only support a downward depression of terrain based on primitive shapes. Something that would be interesting is thinking about how this could be extended to be more generic. If it allowed shapes or brushes that could do the inverse and build upwards, you could essentially have an in-game variant of landscape sculpting, which could have some cool implications. With that, I'll hand it over to Mike. Thank you, Chris. This next section of our talk moves into some of the optimizations we did to get us to 60 frames per second. We'll start off talking about some of our GPU optimizations. One of our big performance wins for Gears 5 was our async post-processing. If we look at this image of our frame, we have two chunks at the beginning and the end that are very polarizing in their GPU usage. Let's zoom in to just those chunks and take a look. The green on our pre-pass is our ALU-bound vertex shader work, and the blue chunk under post-processing is our memory bandwidth heavy pixel shader work. Combine that with their close proximity within the frame, and these areas are prime candidates for async compute. Since this was a major engine change, we knew we were going to have to tackle it in stages. We chose these steps so that we could continue to work and commit work while maintaining a working build. Our first step was to move as much of our post-processing chain as we could to compute. Once that was done, we switched it over to be async compute, but still kept the present in the same place and just blocked. Finally, we moved our present to just after our pre-pass, where we would block and wait until the work was complete. Having these options helped a lot with testing, as we would frequently turn async post-processing on and off in the build as we stabilized it and fixed bugs. These steps all sound rather easy, but each of these steps is a very large task, and the ripple effects to the rest of the frame are pretty substantial. We found that some of the conversions to compute can fool you into thinking this is an easy task. If we take, for example, a post-process that is just doing pixel processing on a full-screen quad, the change is quite reasonable. There's a little bit more boilerplate code around our operations, but nothing extraordinary. We may have a dozen lines that we've added to do the conversion. In contrast, let's take a look at one part of our lens flare system. This is a pretty simple pixel and vertex shader that just blur the areas behind the flare. Converting this stage to compute meant redoing a lot of the work that vertex and pixel shaders were doing for us for free. Not only was it a lot of work, but it was slower to execute than its vertex and pixel shader equivalents. However, allowing our entire chain to be moved to async compute is critical to the performance of this system. Besides the conversion work, there were quite a few other engine changes and learnings along the way. Our frame timing became a lot more complicated as different systems kind of wanted two different types of timings. One from the start of pre-pass to the present of the frame 
and another for the time from one full frame submission to the start of another full frame submission. Split screen was also a challenge for us. Enough of a challenge that when we shipped, async post processing was disabled for split screen. We'll try again for future products, but we were unable to get this completed for Gears 5. Balancing work between async compute and graphics also had a major impact and does require some tuning to get right. We gained half a millisecond by restricting resources to async compute to get the right balance for us, but you're going to have to tune for your engine. We also found it difficult to see results on some of our optimizations, as a lot of the tools will serialize async compute for consistency or not track it at all. There are a few good tools for async compute like Radeon GPU Profiler and the new PIX timing captures, but in the end our final timings came mostly to wall clock timing with optimized builds. Finally, probably the biggest hurdle for async post-processing was that almost everything needs to be converted in order to see the benefit. Because post-processing is a chain, interrupting any part of that chain to change queues is usually noticeably slower than the non-async path. This meant we were very late in the process before we were able to see what sort of gains we were going to get from this system. While this is not a task for the faint of heart, the results for us were quite impressive. Our pre-pass timing went up by 0.8 milliseconds to 2.5 milliseconds total, and our post-processing went up by 0.4 milliseconds to be 3.5 milliseconds total but async turns this into a max calculation instead of a sum. So on average, we were seeing about 1.25 millisecond savings with async post-processing enabled. Our final trick to hit a consistent 60 frames per second was dynamic resolution. At the end of the frame, we would analyze our frame time, and if it was higher than our 16 millisecond target, we would aggressively drop our resolution until we hit that target. We would then slowly bring the, the resolution back up until we settled at 60 frames per second. We also used dynamic resolution on Gears 4, but a big change for us for Gears 5 was switching to Epic's temporal upsampling for scaling between our dynamic resolution target and our final output buffer. Temporal upsampling is expensive. It's usually just under 10% of our frame at 60 frames per second. However, it is almost always a benefit to us to use an upsampler, even for very minor dynamic resolution scaling, as this also includes our full anti-aliasing costs, and a lot of the operations are overlapping in functionality. One of our big tricks for making dynamic resolution work without sacrificing quality was that we did not rely on it. It was our final failsafe, but it was not enabled until very, very late in the project, and we pushed hard to hit our frame rate goals without it. We wanted 4K 60 FPS gaming. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jordan Logan from AMD, who will talk about some of our DirectX 12 optimizations. Hi, I'm Jordan Logan. I am a GPU dev tech at AMD, and I'm here to talk about eliminating DX12 hitches on PC. The first thing to know is that PCs are not consoles, which should be obvious. This means that you must share your resources with the other apps and the OS. We'll start off with using a five second benchmark of gameplay for measuring the number of hitches that happen. And in these five seconds, there will be four gigabytes of data traveling across the bus, hundreds of resources being created and thousands of unique PSOs. Here we have a graph of the spikes seen in those five seconds of gameplay with a naive implementation of DirectX 12. We have a lot of spikes with the worst hitting 140 milliseconds, this means that we have a pretty bad average FPS. Now let's start optimizing this. We'll start with the highest spike at 140 milliseconds. The first spike is actually creating PSOs. PSOs can be fast to create or they could take seconds based on the complexity of the code and the CPU that the person is using. Now there are hundreds of PSOs used in levels and the chance of hitting one of these really complex PSOs that, take, that could take seconds is quite high. So why can't it take so long to create a PSO? Well, from a driver perspective, there's a lot of steps that must be done. The ISA for the graphics card must be created from the intermediate language, as well as applying any optimizations to this code. After that, GPU state needs to be determined for the PSO. And then lastly, the PSO needs to be uploaded to the VRAM on the GPU for fast access. Sometimes a small state change can also require a recompile, and sometimes it don't. Uh, it is very de 
dependent on the vendor if a recompile is required or not for certain state changes. The driver has many different levels of cache to try and help mitigate the cost of compiling. So the best strategy is to not create these at runtime where they can affect the player experience. Unfortunately, we were not able to do this in Gears due to the material system of UE4. Instead, we had to come up with a new solution. To solve this issue, Gears used a PSO caching scheme. By recording the PSOs that were used during gameplay by their QA team, they were able to compile P what PSOs are needed for each level and then we would be able to create all of them at level loading. Now to save memory, they would immediately destroy all these PSOs. This way we can save video memory, but still be able to create these a lot faster because we'll reuse the cache blobs and thus we only have to do a very little amount of work compared to creating from scratch. There are still hundreds of PSO creations, maybe even thousands at the beginning of each level. To do this correctly, uh, we, you need to have an async multi-thread PSO creation. Uh, this will be kicked off well before the level is visible along with other stuff like level geometry. Now with that PSO creation taken care of, let's move on to the next spike. We'll rerun our little gameplay and let's look at the graph. The graph is a lot better, but we still have some 140 millisecond spikes. So let's move on to the next highest spike. The next spike is from creating textures. These are typically quite fast, but they can definitely take a long time to create. A high number of textures are, already, are being loaded at level load, but not all of them will fit into memory. So there must be some texture streaming, thus having textures being created during gameplay. The constant texture stream going on throughout the game means we will be getting constant spikes from this. So why does creating a texture take so long? Well, it has to do with different resource creation functions. So the first one, create committed resources. This is the easy to use one shot resource creation function. It will allocate a heap for physical memory and map it to a given virtual address. The OS may also require that the memory be cleared for security purposes. Um, this means that this ends up being a kernel call to get the virtual memory and the heap. The function is also bad for Windows 7 DX12 since Win 7 does not like having a huge number of individual allocations. The next function would be create place resources. This function requires a heap to be passed in to the create function since it only deals with creating the resource itself. Because there is no memory or address allocation, this function is the fastest of the three to run. You can also use this function to reduce memory overhead. Just make sure to follow the resource initialization rules for place resources. The final function is create reserved resources. This function doesn't require a memory heap and it does not allocate one. Instead, it only allocates virtual addresses for the resource. This one is in the middle of the road in terms of speed when used. But when used right, it's possible to hide the overhead of the function. Unfortunately, this comes at a cost now since now the address lookup buffer can change, increasing the GPU cost of using reserved resources. What happens when you fail to initialize placed or reserved resources? Well, it's undefined behavior and it could result in many different issues like TDRs, blue screens, or even just corruption. Now let's get into how Gears use tiled resources to reduce the number of spikes they had. First off, Gears would allocate a reserved resource for every texture they knew would be used in the game. This removes the override of having to call create reserved resource during gameplay. Then Gears would use four megabyte heaps for textures to stream into and out of, and each MIP would be placed into a different heap with similar size textures. This helped avoid fragmenting the heaps. Gears would then start with a base set of the required heaps based on streaming heuristics and would expand those number of heaps at runtime. This meant that Gears can still hit a hitch if a heap ends up being allocated at runtime. As for render targets and textures, we used placed resources to allow for aliasing and reducing the memory overhead. Well, we're much closer, but there's still a spike that happens at regular intervals. The next spike is the streaming of the textures to VRAM. Gears already runs very close to 16.67 milliseconds for every frame. That leaves no room for any overhead. Also, any non-visual work on the GPU is very likely to be a spike. 
since PCI Express has limited bandwidth, that means we need to share our bandwidth with other traffic that is happening. This could be constant buffers being read through the upload heap or command buffers being executed. The GPU does not need to wait for the MIP to be streamed. It can continue rendering with the lower MIP while the higher one is streaming in. This is what the copy queue is for. It runs asynchronous to the graphics and compute queues without using the resources. It is also the fastest way to transfer data across the PCI Express bus as the graphics and compute queues may not be able to fully utilize the bus. For these reasons, it's best to use the copy queue to copy over the texture while graphics continues to output frames. Once the copy is done, the CPU can update the next frame's descriptors with the new MIP. If the graphics queue really does need to wait for the copy, then it might be faster to just use the graphics queue to do it as the cost of synchronization may be far greater than the improvement in bandwidth. How does our timing graph look now that we've implemented that? Ah, this is much better. We still have two spikes. These are from the OS and profiling tools. So the moral of the story is you still gotta share your resources with the OS. I'll now turn it over to Chris who will go over the conclusions. Thanks Jordan, I'll wrap things up. One of our early pillars for Gears 5 was that we wanted to be hitting 60 frames per second with no visual compromises. As a team, we feel good about where we ended up on both our performance and how the game looked. For getting our geometry to fit into our budget, we found a couple of great alternatives to slogging our GPU with tons of triangles. One of the things that was key to getting both our RCMs and tessellation to land was planning for scalability from the start with tuning knobs so that they still run great on lower end hardware and can enhance visuals on the upper end. We invested a lot of time into environment interactions, which was a big visual win. A strategy that worked out well was starting with a tech that was a catch-all Swiss army knife for effects, our interaction pass, and then when they hit the limits of what it could do, we made custom tech like our deformer pass. For PC, we tried to view it as a console. We made sure that optimization work, like our async post-processing and dynamic resolution, ran well across all platforms. Something that worked well was ensuring that devs were always responsible for running their feature on both PC and Xbox, rather than splitting the team between platforms. And finally, for getting it to a hitch-free experience, we really don't think we could have done this outside of DX12. In previous APIs like DX11, a lot of these hitches were a complete mystery to the developer and it didn't have the kind of API control we have today. In addition, tools like CopyQs give us even more options to leverage every inch of hardware to maintain a 16 millisecond budget. Finally, this was not just the work of me and Mike, but a tight collaboration between our rendering team and the tech art team. It's always a privilege to be working with these talented folks at the Coalition, and I wanted to send out a special thanks to everyone on the hard work that went into Gears 5. And that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed it and thanks for watching.